Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special podcast today. We have the Tycos team with us, and this includes Simon Shack and Patrick Holmquist. And these are the people that invent, uh, well, Simon invented the theory, uh, which we can call the Tycos. And then Patrick got involved and manifested in the Tycosium, which is the three-dimensional model that we'll share with you in just a moment. Now, the first book or website came out in 2018, it was released by Simon, and you can find that at tycos.info, but that's the old website. The new website and the new release of information, and that's where we want you to go, is tycos.space, uh, where you can read all about it. You can access the Tycosium. Um, they are now have a book in there that's uh, 35 chapters long, I think, at this point. Uh, that might be correct. Now, just for background, for people that didn't see the Tycos podcast, the Tycos is a revised model of the solar system. Um, it basically comes from the Tychonic model from Longmontanus in his Astronomia Danica in 1622. This is Tycho Brahe's uh, mother work, let's say. Um, but the semi-Tychonic model they're using or the Tycos model is slightly different because it's not geocentric where Earth is just sitting there stationary, it's actually moving a little bit. It's kind of still in the middle, but it has a uh, orbit, so to speak. And this is fascinating because the, the reason that I want to promote this and have everyone look into it is that this Tycho's model, well, it answers a series of long-standing questions that are unsettled riddles in astronomy. And we're going to get into that in a minute, and it almost answers all of them. Uh, it's a lot of technical jargon, so I won't get into it but we'll get into it in the podcast. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Diamond. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Same here. Pleasure. Now, Simon, you don't have video, so he's got that little fancy whirl in the bottom. <laughs> um, can you take us through uh, how you came up with the Tycho's model? Yes. Well, I uh, started maybe maybe ten years ago now, and look, looking into looking into astronomy, uh, just just by curiosity. Curiosity really was was my first uh, motivation because I started looking at um, how I was I was thinking of how 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 will how does it why does a sun do this analemma? If you've heard about that, that's the shape that the sun does during a year, and it's an eight, uh, elongated eight shape, in the, in the shape of a number eight, and that's what the sun does over a year. And I was wondering why. I understood why it was uh, low in the sky in December and high in June, of course, but I, I wonder why it was also oscillating uh, sideways. So it made this eight instead of just a straight line. So that was my first thing I was trying to figure out, and uh, just didn't work in the Copernican model. So that was my first, uh, yeah, probably my first uh, real uh, what what really kicked off the the whole research. But then you know it got more and more complicated, and and I saw more and more problems with the Copernican system, and I started looking at what had been <coughs> sorry, what had been. Um, uh, devised before what other systems <coughs> had existed and uh, that's 10 years ago when i discovered very late in my life <coughs> Tycho Brahe and his iconic system <coughs> but i started looking into that because it was uh, very interesting um to see that he had actually devised he was uh, ridiculed because he had the sun and mars the, the orbits of sun and mars intersecting and that was everyone was laughing at him for this because they were figuring that they would crash sooner or later into each other. But that's, of course, not the case. What he had discovered unwittingly, Tycho Brahe, the great Danish astronomer who spent his life uh, looking at the stars and made the best tables ever made of the motions of the stars in the 16th, 16th century, he had discovered unwittingly that we are a binary system. And what's a binary system? Most people don't know it even, but, but it's incredible because now, today, we know that almost 
at least all the all the closest stars, all, all the nearmost stars we have, are double. They are binary. So that means that if we see a star in the sky at night, we can be sure that it has a companion and that it revolves around this companion in intersecting orbits. So when I discovered that, I said, my gosh, so if all the stars now, at least 90%, but probably all, but officially they already say, they admit that the 90% are binary. So I would say that maybe the, the remaining 10% is just that we haven't found the small companions of, of the rest. Uh, I, I, this is my, my postulation is that all, all the stars have a companion, but we'll see in the future. Uh, so in, if that's the case, why would our sun not have a companion? That's yeah. Statistically absurd. So that's the basic, the fundamental thing to understand. Because it's if that's the first thing that they will object. Uh, I, I finish now. Um, the first thing that is objected, usually very commonly, is that oh, why would the sun go around, you know, Mars? And uh, you know, that's that's funny. Uh, why would the sun move around a, a, a circle? Well, all stars move around the circle. They all have local orbits, as I like to call them. So our sun has a local orbit that lasts for one year. Uh, Sirius, the biggest star in our sky, has a local orbit which lasts for 50 years. But then you have you have uh, stars that only only go around for they have a period of a few weeks. So that's the kind of uh, you know you have star binary stars that go around each other for just weeks or months, or a year, like the sun, or 20 or 50, but not 250 million, which is what they say that the sun, that's the orbit of the sun around the galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> you see? So I can confirm that uh, in, in just the last decade, our understanding of brown dwarfs and stars in general has gone from the lone uh, star just out there in the universe to these binary and trinary systems. And the, the more and more they look and the better instrumentation, it's getting increasingly, increasingly clear that all of these stars have systems. And, and so they're all rotating yes. with other objects and yes. none of them are stationary. So there's always a Berry Center. And this is an yes. imaginary place in a space in space upon which these objects are rotating around it. And that is the basically the Tychosium. And Patrick, mm -hmm. you developed this 3D model, which, uh, so you put the model together. You didn't know where the Berry Center was. It simply reveals itself to you when you make the model. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I would like to describe myself mostly as a, a tool maker here. Uh, I've, uh, I've made the, the tool uh, that Simon needed to, to check to test everything and he and he has put in all the values and speeds and and what we have discovered now is that this uh, this model using and that and that is important to point out using only circular motion circular uniform motion as opposed to elliptical non-uniform motion but using only circular uniform motion we have been able to make this extremely observationally correct and we have a, th there is a, a, a section in the menu that's called positions and there you get right ascension and, and declination for all, all the, the planets and these uh, confirm with what you can find in in stellarium or or uh, J nasa's jpl etc so this model works and it's extremely simple motion compared to to uh, what other uh, stellariums or planetariums use because they use uh, yeah, complicated statistical motions and 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 perturbations everything has to be adjusted in in a very painstaking ways so to so to speak so yeah yeah. Now, this is interesting because as I'm staring at the uh, Tychosium here, it looks like um, Mercury and Venus 
are moons of the sun. And, yes. and that if you bring it out, you can also include Mars. So Mars, Mercury, and Venus are moons mm -hmm. of the no. sun. But you're saying no, that... You go, if you, sorry if I interrupt you. If you can yeah. go backwards now. Can you stop the, the simulator and go backwards where you were before? So you, you, you stop the run and now you... you yeah, you can go some weeks No, backwards. you can use uh, step, step backward. Step backward. And step, yeah, step below backward. that. that <laughs> I know there is no manual step, for Tycosium yet. Right. So it's a bit... Uh, yeah, you can do it that right, way. Right, you can do it this way. And I can tell you where you should stop. So, uh, no, almost now, more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Uh, right here. You can stop here. Okay. And could you please rotate the whole thing 180 degrees? Because that's what the default set. Okay. Now you need to put, you have this. The Earth must be up, pointing up to the screen, the Earth. So just rotate the 3D machine so that the world is... Now it's down. You see the world is down, but the world should be up on um, on its... Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More more to the left now. More to the left. Okay. Okay. No, no. Bef before that, the more, more, a little more. Okay. Because this is like the year, this is how we have it on as a default. You know, when you open a Tychosium, it's easier to, to, to visualize if we keep this uh, uh, view. Because, you know, to the right, we have, we have a March. To the left, we have September. Up, we have June. And down, we have December. Okay? And this is in our epoch, 2000. That's the epoch 2000. We are in 2020 now. So that's, that's where Earth is now. So as you see, on one side we have the sun up here, and then yeah. down we have Mars on the opposite, exactly opposite the sun. So that is that is a classic uh, binary system because that's what they do. They they revolve around each other in intersecting orbits. Now Mars is not the third moon of the sun because it's the only object that go, comes in, in opposition, as, as we have it here. It's the, uh, the two, um, Mercury and Venus, don't do that. They never come in opposition. So they are moons. Also, Mercury and Venus, they, have, they are tightly locked. And uh, whatever anyone else will say, I mean, they say that, no, they're not exactly tightly locked. They're two to three. But that's, uh, I explain in the book that this is a misconception. Until the 1960s, they were saying that Mercury was tightly locked. But then NASA came and said, no, it has a two to three because it didn't work with the <laughs> calculations. But in, 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 in reality, they are tightly locked, which means that they show the same face to their host, i.e., i.e., the sun all the time, just like our moon shows the same face to us. And that is the definition of the moon. It, it shows the same face to its host. And it rotates very slowly, indeed. So the, mm -hmm. the, the moon rotates at 16 kilometers an hour, and and uh, v and Mercury uh, three times slower, and, and uh, Venus six times slower. In fact, exactly, it's one at three. It's a one three six uh, progression of uh, so Venus is, is rotates very slowly at, at two point seven kilometers an hour. Well, so, and Venus is the only orbit that the mainstream concedes is circular, as well as Mercury. So it's the, their orbits of those inner planets are. They are they're more Venus circular. Is very circular. Venus yeah. is very circular, but Mercury is very eccentric. As you see, it's not uh, you know it's it's off center of the sun yeah. for some reason for some reason which I don't know how to explain, but that's how it is. Venus is is very much um, kind of yeah centered and very lit, very slightly eccentric. But so the, the the amazing thing that I found lately in the last few years of research was that. If you now incline, if you incline the, the system, um, you, you, you need to use the r right hand click and, and, and drive it upwards. You, you, you push it, yeah. Right hand click and, and yeah, like this, like this. Okay, okay, more, okay, now. Okay, okay, now, now, that's fine. If now start the, the machine, 
it, it, make it bigger maybe so we can see it right okay well we can win without without starting now do you notice that the orbits of mercury and venus are inclined in the same manner well why are they inclined in the same manner and they always keep this inclination all all every time all the time because they are inclined with the equator of the sun which has a mysterious inclination of six degrees or seven degrees and that is for astronomers a mystery they still need to solve they don't know why the sun has an inclination an axial you know the axis of the sun is uh at, is apparently well they have they have verified it it has an inclination so but uh, good heavens why would the sun be inclined with respect of our our whole system's plane that's a funny thing well the, the, the what interests me what what really matters is that uh in in the tychosium and in the tychosium only we can see that the orbits of mercury and venus which i call the moons of the sun skip at that inclination all year long now you can start it now you can start a run start a run and maybe maybe should i use there. one week or should i use a different one month one month you can you can use okay so so we can see it oh yeah. let's go forward right 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 yeah yep yeah. yes 1.5 uh, uh, one, oh, one, yes, one, one. one yeah okay just now run it and and watch the watch the inclinations of the orbits of mercury and venus they always stay slightly inclined you see six degrees correct yeah six or seven it's you know it, it's a bit it depends also all this uh, you know angle things it depends on on the, on the frame of reference if you're on the earth you will see that um, you will calculate that, that mercury is inclined by 3.5 and that venus is inclined by seven but in reality this is because mercury goes you know faster so and so when i was spring. showing this uh on the first podcast i did um the, the, a lot of the questions were, oh, well, the planets will eventually hit each other in this model. <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't. They won't because, they, I mean, I really need to, to repeat, please look up binary stars. I mean, we know so much about them now, but no one talks about it. Almost, again, almost, almost all the stars are binary. And that means that they have intersecting orbits. They have a companion just like Mars that revolves around they revolve around their common barrier center which well is and what... uh, ancient tribes like the dogon knew about binary stars they knew about sirius oh, yeah. a and b mm -hmm. that's bizarre just just on face value well let me tell you something important about sirius a and sirius b which was also one of my earlier discoveries well it wasn't much of a discovery i just read <laughs> on in a book how in astronomy book how how big they are supposed to be the two companions are series a and series b and my goodness i saw that they are proportionally identical to sun and mars huh. which means i mean in other words series a the big star which is the biggest star we have in our skies by far it's the most brilliant we have that is 205 times bigger than uh, its uh, companion and the sun is 205 times bigger than mars which is incredible coincidence maybe but you know we're talking about the brightest star in our skies and they are identical to the sun and mars i mean how about that for uh, you know to shut up anyone who say oh it's impossible that that's that mars can be a companion of the sun why would that be well just look up in the sky with a good telescope, very good, because Sirius B is very, very small. They only found it in the late 19th century. They, you know, binary systems are a relatively recent discovery. As I said, Tycho Brahe did not know about their existence because the first binary star was discovered 50 years after his death. So he had no way to make any sense out of his iconic system i mean he 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 just drew it because he was an excellent observer and he came to the conclusion that this was was the geometry and but for some reason 
it was discarded by the scientific community. Go figure why, because it worked very well. The only problem that he had also was that he thought that this, <laughs> the earth did, didn't move at all, which is funny because it's strange because we know that all objects in the sky around us all move, have an orbit. So yeah. that was my input. That's my probably the biggest uh, piece of the puzzle that I have added to his model is that the Earth has an orbit and it lasts for 25,344 years. And that is the what we have always called the precession of the equinoxes. So what is the precession of the equinoxes in the Tycho's model? It's simply the fact that we are going around our own orbit, the whole system, the whole system slowly precesses clockwise, which makes us go clockwise. We are in the middle of it. Maybe now you can put it, you can uh, put it up again, uh, like uh, like this, yeah. And and now you can stop it, and and I show you what I mean by the. Okay, now put uh, instead of one month, put uh, one thousand years, and just. 1,000 years, okay, and then now just click a uh, step forward once, you will see the earth moving now, see, now earth is moving, okay, go, 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 like this, and, and if you click 25 times, we will make one turn, the whole system makes this, and that is why we changed north on the stars, now we are under Polaris today, as it is now, yeah. On the other side, we will be under Vega, and then we will return to Polaris. Simple as that. And that's what I, why I call this orbit, which is my invention, really. I call it the PVP orbit. Polaris, Vega, Polaris. So this is the precession of the equinoxes. And what is... So you made the model, and then when you run it, how long is this cycle? 25,000... What did you say? 25,344. Say it again? Yep. 25, uh, 25344. 25344. So that's an interesting number there. Very interesting number. Well, it, it, I came to that through various calculations because I, I, I discovered that the moon has a very, very um, uh, important cycle. Uh, well, a period, uh, which is the real synodic period of the moon, which is 29.22 which the Maya knew about, the Maya astronomers knew about that exact uh, figure. What about and the lunar standstill, the 18.6 year cycle? Is that included in the model? 18.6 is, is it a, a long cycle of, uh, of the moon, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's actually, you know, there is different long-term cycles. Uh, each, each, each planet and each moon has long-term cycles. And, and, and so... The thing is that I came to twenty five three four four because that would that that matched. Um, it's hard to explain here now in words, but you can read that in my book. And by the way, the book is, is uh, on uh, psychospace is finished. We don't have only five chapters; we have 30, 32. Okay. It came out in uh, the new second edition came out in um, March on March twenty one this year. So um, I just wanted to put that in there. So it's freely available. Uh, it's uh, on this website. The 32 chapters are all there for everyone to read. Yeah, and I'll, I'll bring are, us over there. We are feverishly looking for a publisher, actually, right now, because uh, people are starting to ask for a hard copy, but it's still not available, unfortunately. So here we are over at the website, tychos.space. Um, you can go to the Tychosium on the right side where it says, let's go. And the Tychos mm -hmm. on the left uh, brings you to the table of contents of the book. And yeah, there you can you access book. all of the channel, uh, all the chapters. Yes. Um, yeah. So you're, you, you sent me over some information on Haley's Comet. Uh, yeah. There's lots of problems with Haley's Comet. Well, the Halley's Comet is, is, has been the last part of this last year of, of really deep research. And it's amazing uh, how important it is to, how important it is, maybe Patrick may tell you how, how crucial Halley's Comet is to our system because it's, it resolves 
so many things and it actually goes to prove that um, the, the tycosium or the tycos is um, is the only way to explain the the, the the Halley's Comet, how it moves and how it returns and so forth. Yeah, now for those that don't know, uh, there's been so many ludicrous uh, explanations on the strange movements of Halley's Comet where they propose that it speeds up and slows down yeah, because, yeah. because of the gas giants. But yeah. Like all of the observations on all bodies, like comets and asteroids, we've seen that doesn't happen. They have a pretty constant speed, um, and so this just seems like nonsense that they can't explain. Now, Halley's comet is one of the most well-known celestial visitors in our space. I mean, yep. it's been witnessed back into like 1100 or earlier, probably. And just the fact that we don't know how it operates, can you explain this uh, graphic that we have up here? Yes, well, this is uh, this is a screenshot from the Tychosium, which we were looking at before. Only that uh, I've been, you can activate the trace function, and that will show you that all all the bodies in our system make these funny pretzels, <laughs> sloops, and because it's like they are, it's all because of the suns. The sun is going around here in the middle. And and that will you 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 can you know to understand to imagine it in your head you would have to imagine like all the these bodies are attached like like an invisible string to this to the sun and that's why they do these things it's like a you know a, a girl with a hula hoop around her waist okay yeah that's a good a she, very if good she, if she if she rotates. Okay, the hula hoop will go around in a, in a circle, but um, her waist, which goes around in a smaller circle, will also influence the actual trajectory of the hula hoop itself, right? So you have to think about just the, you know a girl with a hula hoop, and that will make these um, pretzel things in reality. So in, is in, that in, when we see one of these loops? Is that going to be observed as a, a like a type of retrograde motion happening again and again and again? That's right. I mean, for the uh, for our planets here. I mean, here we have only we can see Jupiter and Saturn, for instance. Okay, here are the, the the white and the gray ones here. They will uh, periodically go back, appear to go backwards, but it's nothing magical or nothing strange. It's simply a geometric reality. If you have a, a rotating uh, uh, ball revolving around another, another uh, rotating ball, it will do trochoidal loops. These are called tro trochoids in, in, in geometric language. It's also a spirograph. And a lot of people pointed yeah. out the fact that yeah. these exactly match ancient mandala. And, and, <laughs> and it may be that ancient cultures knew of this motion. And oh, that's yes. actually what they were recording. Oh yes, yes. Uh, they probably knew, uh, and it's amazing to read some ancient um, accounts of how how much they knew. But um, let's just stay, <laughs> if you will. I can, if uh, sorry, Patrick, Peter, I, I can, uh, I can show you. Uh, I've set it up here so we can see how this movements live here. If I share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, can I pick? Yeah, here we go. And I will add it to the stream. Yes. That's fantastic. So here we, <laughs> yeah, here we see, and it's it's approaching. Uh, it's approaching now, and the date is two thousand and sixty-one. We're looking uh, at Halley's. Here, here is Halley's yeah. close to the Earth here. So that flyby is 2061 when it gets that close? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, that, and that's officially predicted as well. And that's yeah. is. But it's, it, it gets strange. I mean, the, the, the official tables are really strange because then they, uh, the next after this one, after 2061, they say it's going to happen in 2134. But that's only 73 years later. And and uh, doesn't make any sense what, because uh, in other epochs it takes seventy nine years for Halley to come back to Earth. Why would there be a six year plus minus six year fluctuation? Why would that be? Well, 
they have tried to explain this for many years. It must be the uh, perturbations uh, of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, yeah. and Venus, and that will somehow slow down or speed up Halley's Comet. But in, in my book, in chapter 30, I have now really elucidated why this um, comedy of errors has made them believe this. Because as you see, when Halley's come, okay, maybe you can stop here. Yes, Patrick, perfect. Uh, as you can see, when Halley's comes close to our neighborhoods, uh, it will be possible to see it in different years, not only in one year. But they think they can only be seen once, you know, in one, one certain year, and then we have to wait another 60, 60, 76. But in the Tychosium, maybe we can show, we look at from above. It's less confusing, Patrick. Right, from above and so? a bit, small, bit smaller, yeah. So you see, it's coming, as it comes towards Earth, it may be visible, uh, you know, a year before or a year later, or actually even for a, a maximum of three successive years. So sometimes they will see it, because the problem is that it's not, it doesn't come back exactly the same place. So sometimes it will come back in a place where it's uh, in the glare of the sun, and we won't see it. We will just see it in the next turn. So we will say, okay, that's the that's the year that passed. But the next time it comes around, the opposite will happen, you know. And then you will have this lag of two or three years, and they could never make any sense out of it. But I've now checked wow. so many, so many ancient accounts and ancient or just uh, from a few centuries ago all the all the passages actually have, uh, all the way to bc uh, i've been checking whether they, there are records for the passages as the tecosium shows and i found so many so i'm really really satisfied that that this must be the way halis moves and mind you, Halley's agrees quite well with the most recent passages, agrees with uh, JPL data, you know, uh, very, very often, not all the time, but <laughs> especially when it's closest to Earth, it will be almost at the same place as they say. And uh, really remarkable, uh, sometimes it's really, it's, especially when it's very close, it will be in the right place, in the right side of Earth and so forth. So I just encourage anyone to to read the chapter thirty where it's all explained. It's it's very really complicated because we're looking at the spirograph, you know. Yeah. So it, it's hard to wrap your head around it, but I've done it and I, I've I've checked it and it works marvelously. Now the the whole idea that these that mandalas and that are actual representations of celestial mo movements. Uh, do you have any examples of that? Uh, from uh, ancient texts or anything like that? Uh, to be honest, I haven't looked so much into mandalas and things. Uh, I've been so concentrated on <laughs> just building this uh, this uh, this model, and I will do so in the future. I mean, to see, look more into the mandala. Um, uh, but you think you know? I was I went to India in 2016. That's uh, two years before I released my first book. And I met an old astronomer in his office. He was kind enough to to hear me for three hours. And he gave me a book he had written. And I opened it, and there was another uh, uh, model made by um, their most famous astronomer, naked eye astronomer. It's called Patani Samantha. Patani Samantha turns out to have done uh, designed the exact same system as Tycho Brahe. So even in India, <laughs> and he's Patani Samanth is considered the most incredible um, uh, naked eye astronomer. He didn't use telescopes, although he lived after Tycho Brahe in the 18th century. But he was, you know, in the woods somewhere and 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 making his uh, designing his system, and he came to the same conclusions uh, as Tycho Brahe, which is the Sun and Mars intersecting. Wow. Have you uh, forwarded this to any other uh, mainstream astronomers or astrophysicists to have a look at? 
or have and have they turned you down or oh david <laughs> i've been there uh, i went three months in 2018 when the first book came out i was uh, invited by a friend in uh, in um, in uh, minneapolis and i went around for three months in the states and my friend was really he, he's an old colleague I mean, he's an old friend he's a colleague of mine since many years and so he organized um, for instance we went to a three-day symposium in a big hilton hotel it was one of the biggest uh, astronomy astronomy meetings in america actually we we're lucky enough that it happened in minnesota that year and they gave us a table and we had the book uh, you know the first book uh, is available in hard copy so we had a few copies of the book and we have a table and we had a computer with a screen with this psychosium running the one you're looking at now and people stopped at our table all the time and they made uh, many questions and but when we, when some important a uh, person from NASA or, or, or turned up, you know, to make a speech and would come to our table. He would just sniff and say, oh, no, this is this is nonsense and so on. But 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 we met some other astronomers, you know, you know basically usually veteran astronomers, you know, uh, uh, who are you know, uh, retired and they w would be more open minded and they would buy the book and then uh, i was just actually invited we were invited up to duluth to um buy an astronomer who runs the uh, the big um, planetarium at duluth university and he was he was absolutely absolutely enthusiastic about it so yes we have a few we have we had a good few a good few people who who are taking it seriously if that's what you were asking. Yeah, and that's that's where you need to start, and that's why we're doing this podcast. Mm. Uh, Patrick, what are your intentions uh, being involved in this project, and what do you see the future bringing? And and get the book published already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And let's get that message uh, out again. We are actively looking for a publisher, mm -hmm. and uh, the manuscript is very available. <laughs> It's at tycos.space. So if anyone reads this and, and finds it as interesting as we do and are or know a publisher, uh, please uh, get in touch with us. Uh, we can be reached if you, if you uh, contact Dave or if you contact Simon. Uh, so please get in touch if, if you know... Uh, if you're a publisher or, or no publisher who would be interested in this because uh, we need to get it out uh, to get a, a real um, uh, professionally produced book of this and as as you asked what what, what do i see with the future well i i've, I've you know i'm a i'm a programmer i have have enjoyed uh, doing programming all my life and I, I've not done as much uh, graphical or, or 3D programming, but I've, I've learned this uh, while doing this and I'm, I'm working on um, a new uh, version of the Tech Ocean that will be uh, vastly improved compared to this one. And uh, uh, so, so it, it will, will be much better looking and you can you know view things in a in a more uh, graphically compelling way so and and i mean as i said it's 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 very uh, amazing to to be part of this because as i have understood this is the first actually uh, simulation that's uh, to be blunt geometrically possible because the the model we have with a, a, a heliocentric model, it isn't geometrically possible. I mean, if we are supposed to move sideways in the universe by 300 million kilometers every six months without the stars or, I mean, it doesn't work with, with the geometry and paradoxes, just as Tycho Brahe pointed out 400 years ago, you know? 
So, but if we do it this way, if we have a, a geo heliocentric system, uh, things uh, fall into place, or so we can have uh, a model that works. So, yeah. Yeah, if you, we could just get some uh, serious scientists instead of poo pooing it at door to understand <laughs> that uh, this geometry answers riddles of astronomy, including but not limited to the failed Nicholson Morley experiment, the James Bradley aberration of light, the anomalous precession of Mercury's perihelion, the curious mm -hmm. eight shaped analemma. Why only Mercury and Venus have no moons? Why both Mars and the Sun exhibit 79 year cycles, which also is. Haley's Comet apparently exhibits <laughs> and no, on and on. I mean, that's just yeah. a, a short list of some of the things this answers. It's a, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Halley's Comet has a 76 year cycle, not 79, but 75.66666. Uh, <laughs> I mean, periodic. Um, but you know, yeah, uh, those cycles. I mean, why does this, the Sun and Mars have 79 year cycles? Actually, uh, they are actually, since they are um, uh, at that one to two ratio, you can also find a 39.5 cycle of the sun, how it wobbles on its, around its own very center. So that's 39.5 is exactly half 79. Uh, so it, you really, you really can see there are so many indications that the sun and Mars are, are companions. That's what I wanted to say. Another one thing I want to say, because I like to anticipate the questions I know people will always ask, you know. So it's um, it's about, does this model match with the, the, the observational tables that we have? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. It matches with all the positions of the all the planets and even their distance from Earth. It doesn't change. It, it simply moves differently, but amazingly enough, and in spite of all the planets going at constant speeds and going around circular orbits, or neutral orbits, okay, because they do these funny loops, well, in spite of this, it works. Whereas Kepler had to invent mathematically that all planets speed up and slow down speed up and slow down all the time <laughs> for some weird reason. Why would they do that? I mean, just think about it. Why would they speed up and slow down? Mercury is supposed to, to change by 30% its speed all the time, uh, up and down, plus or minus 30%. Why would it do that? Uh, all the other planets are also supposed to speed up and slow down in Kepler's uh, imagination really because <laughs> it's a mathematical uh, thing he did there mathematical i love it yeah. now guys if you can't find a publisher have you considered crowdfunding because you probably raised 10 to thirty thousand uh with you know a kickstarter campaign for the book where everyone gets a signed copy and for 89 dollars oh, yeah. you get a signed copy of the book thousand or more people would definitely buy that that's like 10 20 grand and then you could self-publish but I mean, you'd have to do your own editing mm. and art and stuff, but it's, a, mm -hmm. it, it, it works. Uh, a friend mm -hmm. of mine who's a permaculture independent researcher has been very successful in publishing books that way. So, and I'd be happy to help with it. Oh, wow. Well, we, I guess we just don't have, you know, the, the, uh, the skills or, of, or marketing, marketing, marketing skills. So yes, please help us. Uh, whoever wants to help us. Cool. And anyone else who wants to help or knows a publisher, please contact us below. Uh, get Contact me directly at Oppenheimer Ranch at Gmail. And Patrick and Simon are easily accessed through uh, tycos.space, where you can contact them through the website. Right. Yeah. So it's been a pleasure having you guys on. Let's do this again soon and uh, maybe talk about more specific topics or mm -hmm. we can talk about maybe the book getting published. Um, some final words on... Uh, maybe the show or anything you want to talk about. We'll start with you, Simon. Well, um, I just want to maybe um, uh, talk some logic here. I mean, we, we, have, we have always believed that the, sun, the Earth goes around the sun, and that means that we are going at a speed of 90 times the speed of sound. 
because that's 107,000 kilometers an hour. That's 90 times. That's 90 Mach. That's fast. That's fast. <laughs> <laughs> and we have accepted it. But, you know, why would that be? And isn't Earth a bit special anyway? I mean, we have water and life, you know? It must be. There must be something different with Earth, and I'm, I'm. What I'm thinking is that the, the reason why we have life and and water is maybe because we are very tranquil planets, very slow moving. Because we're so we're not moving uh, eighty nine thousand miles an hour. That makes no, sense. No, we we are moving at one mile per hour. Yep. In so all those flat Earthers that are like the water will slosh off, it won't <laughs> slosh off at one mile an hour now. No, no, but <laughs> but you know, <laughs> flat earthers are. This has it's been such a successful operation that <laughs> the flat earthers thing because they are associating flat earthers to all those who don't believe in NASA, and yeah. uh, I happen not to believe in NASA either because that's the most stupid uh, industry uh, of Earth. It's really a big, big. Um, it's a huge, huge hoax. But we, we, we won't go there now. It's uh, another thing. Anyone is free, is free to believe that NASA can land on asteroids <laughs> that, go at, uh, that go at very, very high, high speeds. So, you know, it's, it's free for everyone to believe in that. Um, I, I'm, I'm just saying, is it, is it reasonable to think that we are going at 90 times the speed of sound? I don't think so. Uh, is it more reasonable that we are maybe much going very slowly? I think that's more reasonable. And then uh, I repeat, we now know that all the stars around us, absolutely 100% of the nearmost stars, 100% of the nearmost stars, the, the closest stars, are binary. They have a companion. Just take the sun. And they revolve around intersecting orbits. Why would the sun not do that? Why would it be a complete exception? The only, you know, single poor man in 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 our skies, uh, without a wife. Of course, <laughs> you know. No, he must have a wife, <laughs> and uh, Mars is the wife, or or vice versa. Maybe yeah. the Sun is the wife. So that's all I wanted to to, to say. I mean, the, 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 the logic of the system, the basic and, and fundamental logic of the system is really makes sense to me, to Patrick, and to more and more people now. And uh, this is what has to be, you have to start thinking that it is absolutely legitimate to question the Copernican system because it has geometrical problems. Right. In the book, I show other geometrical problems. You know, Mars can can face the same star in different periods of time, which which is absolutely it it violates the most basic laws of perspective. Yeah, and, and so uh, do and so do the retrogrades uh, motions as well. Well, I appreciate you uh, answering all these questions in astronomy, and the fact that we're going to stick with the heliocentric model when we're looking out at all the other objects that are in binary systems is ludicrous, but it, time takes time. It takes decades to change a paradigm like this. And mm. at some point we'll hear a popping noise and uh, maybe it'll change. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, and we appreciate you, Simon Shack. Uh, keep up the good work. Patrick, final All words. Right. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for having us, Simon. Uh, I would just like to, my final word would be to say, if, if you cannot ask yourself a question, it's very hard to get an answer to it. And, and, and what I would say regarding this is that we have been very conditioned to not be able to ask this fundamental question. Does it make sense that the Earth is revolving around the sun? Can, 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 we, can we confirm that using observations and ex experiments? And, and, and the, the answer to that is no, we cannot confirm that. And, but, but if we start looking at it the other way, uh, if the sun is, is um, uh, orbiting the Earth, uh, things start to change. That we can confirm using observations and experiments. But every time that has been done, like with the Michelson-Morley experiment, uh, etc., it's been uh, you know twisted around and obfuscated and 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 pushed to the side. 
So it's it's really the same issue as with with the shape of Earth that for some reason seems so much more interesting than this fundamental question, and it's it's very com they very confused as well. But but I mean, every observation and experiment we have made uh, concerning that question is the Earth a rotating sphere? Yes, it is. That we when we we do that we confirm this and and. And here we have another, uh, but to me, much more interesting question. Uh, and that is the, con the actual configuration of the, the solar system. And, and uh, uh, Simon's book makes a very clear case, a very good case that this is, and uh, as well, the, the Tychosium, it's a demonstration of the model and it checks out. So. Thank you for taking a look into this. Yeah, I appreciate both of you. You heard it here first. The uh, Tychosium explains the observations. The current uh, Copernican model does not, and the heliocentric model does not. There's too many questions unanswered. The Tychos answers them, and we appreciate you, you two guys uh, for standing up for science. And we'll talk to you soon. If there's any publishers out there that want to get involved, please contact us and go check out the Tychosium and the book uh, on the website, tychos.space. That's Boone. Thanks for coming, guys. All right. Thank you.